your financial journey in creating, growing, protecting, preserving your family's wealth in today's economy. This is a November investor update, and hopefully you are um, having a wonderful evening, getting ready for Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks, have plans with family, and uh, you're looking forward to some uh, some good downtime and some time to be thankful and, and uh, recognize the blessings that we have. Of course, I do see it's a record attendance this time to the uh, to the investor update, so I assume that means there's some questions out here as well that you, uh, you're wondering how things are going and where things are headed in the future. So hopefully tonight, give you a little bit of insight into what I think is happening and uh, what I feel confident about and what I'm still trying to get my head around just as many of you are as well. So let me go ahead and start with uh, reminding you about the disclosures. Uh, as always, uh, everything we talk about on our uh, investor update has to do with uh, sort of the information we find at this point in time, it can change even tomorrow, uh, as obvious as that may be to some. Uh, also, we cover a lot of different issues. So depending upon your uh, your experience and your skill set, please feel free to reach out with questions that we might have uh, later on in our presentation and the update to, to answer those. Uh, we want to cover information that covers a broad range, so it might cover some things you're looking for and some things that you may need more information on. So please, as always, uh, feel free to ask questions, and anything that we talk about that uh, might deal with tax or legal issues, we would really appreciate if you would bring in your accountant or your attorney to make sure that everything that we're talking about makes sense for your situation risk issues, investment issues, income issues, all of it together. We want to make sure that it makes sense for your situation. We, as I mentioned a moment ago, will have a time for questions. Uh, that's typically at the very end, but uh, sometimes if I see a question come through that I think I should answer right at that moment, I might do that, but feel free to put your questions in. And even if I don't stop then, I assure you we will answer it at the end of uh, the update. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the market and economic review, uh, as well as the portfolio management diversification considerations we're working off of. I'm uh, going to take a few moments on the 2023 planning solutions and strategies that I want you to be aware of and be thinking about for next year. I'll remind you of the apps that we have available to help you maximize your family's wealth management goals and your return on life as it fits with your financial journey. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, when the, uh, we'll answer questions and talk about the next update and when that's happening. So uh, just to kind of uh, refresh from previous discussions, um, we have now had uh, three quarters that have come in. Q1 and Q2 were slightly negative. Uh, Q3 was slightly positive, a little bit more so on the positive side, but not a lot. So we're pretty much flat right now in GDP growth for the U.S. economy. Business profitability still continues to be, uh, continues to be spotty. Uh, we find that some corporations are doing pretty well. We find others are not doing as well. Probably uh, has to do with a number of factors, uh, inflation, uh, the uh, sort of whack-a-mole supply chain issues we're dealing with, uh, policies and uh, issues within government governance and so on. Still, business profitability is more positive than negative, but I give it a plus minus at this point. Uh, unemployment rates are still relatively low. Uh, it has a lot to do, I think, with underemployment issues or those who have been doing the, uh, the silent quitting. Uh, I think that we're finding employers still needing to bring employees on and uh, sometimes struggling to find those employees. So the unemployment rates remain low at this point, which is uh, still a positive. It, that, uh, we're wondering how that's going to look here by the end of this year with some of the potential layoff conversations that we've been hearing. But at this point in time, still considered to be a positive. And interest rates uh, are rising, although um, we might be at the end of the rate hikes. I think it's kind of questionable. I, I hear some that talk about how this probably is the end. We don't need any more. And then I see market performance and market issues. and makes me think that maybe there might be another interest rate hike coming down the road, but they might not be as big as they have been. So we've left interest rates as sort of a negative right now. So we've got some of the engines running full speed and some of them running half speed and one running at less than half speed right now. So those rep represent the leading indicators to what motivates our economy and uh, uh, therefore the markets as well. 
So at this point, picture still has some pluses to it and has some minuses to it. And we're going to drill down a little bit on that here as we go forward. Um, I, I guess before I hit on the market update, let me do this. I want to take a look at the economy and specifically two different issues or one primary issue that I think is on everybody's mind. And right here we go. So I want to take a look and talk about inflation for a moment. I know that that's a, a big issue and you know, I've had this conversation with a number of people. Even today, I had that conversation with somebody and we were talking about uh, inflation and how long can this work and can it go backwards? Does it go forwards? What, what happens? And because I think that at the core of it, that is probably one of the biggest concerns we have is inflation and how that's impacting everything else. So uh, going to uh, the US Inflation Calculator website, what I did was I put in there, what if in 2021, you bought something for a dollar, what would that cost here in 2022? It would cost a dollar 10 because of what the calculator is saying is a 10% increase in inflation. Now it's pulling its data down from CPI and inflation calculation numbers. Uh, that seems to be higher than what I expected, but for the moment, let's leave it at that. Now what I found interesting though, is let's suppose I go back to 2020 and I show it as that time frame. Well, it would cost $1.15, or we've had a cumulative inflation rate of 15.1%. If I take that back to 2010, it would cost $1.37, or a cumulative rate of 36.7%. And to be sure, that's uh, uncomfortable. That's 12 years ago. What we could have bought for a dollar back then is costing us $1.37 now, no doubt about it. That's not uh, good, but it's surprising considering the fact that I think everybody is really concerned about the, uh, the information in the sense that we're looking at 10% inflation or 8% inflation or most recently 7.7% inflation. Uh, and it just feels like this is never going to end, which probably won't end. We probably will continue to have inflation for sure. But when we look at the, accumulate, the cumulative effect of it, um, for instance, looking back 22 years ago to 2000, what we could buy for a dollar uh, is a dollar 73 now, or a cumulative rate of 73.1%, which the 73.1% does seem overwhelming. That's just an incredible number, uh, the rising cost of living. But when you think about it, after 22 years, if something still doesn't cost double yet, uh, that's not a bad inflation rate. Now, when we're going to take a look at some of these numbers here, uh, what I would suggest is that we recognize that inflation is here to stay, but it does adjust different uh, at different times. And I'm going to show you some of the information for that as well. Let's see, we've got a question already here. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is a lot, no doubt about it. I'm not uh, trying to downplay that. But what I would say is when we look at it in the light of where we are, I want you to see some of the data for inflation to kind of understand. And, and this is gonna tie back into the 2023 planning strategies and solutions, because I think that's really critically what everybody should be most focused on. And in that sense, what I would say is this, you don't drive down the road looking down here at the yellow lines by your car, you drive down the road looking as far down the road as you can. And I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. So here's our most recent average inflation year over year, 7.7%. Uh, last year was 7%. And then these are all the years previously going back to 2012. Now, if I break this down, and this is part of what I wanted you to, to begin thinking about. I think most people, um, inflation sounds like uh, some sort of mystical voodoo or something. Uh, he here's what it is. So this number here, 7.7, .7, is taking a look at the last 12 months going back to September, I'm sorry, November of last year, rolling forward 12 months. So what happens is, is that as the inflation rate adjusts and the new data is added to it, we find a, a, a number that either is going up or down. So for instance, we went from 6.2 to 6.8 last year. That's a 0.6% increase. Uh, on the other hand, what we see is that this time we went from 8.2 to 7.7 .7, or a 0.5 a drop. And what that means is, is that with the uh, one number rolling off and the new data added to it, we still went down. Now, 
don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that's a great thing. I'm not, I'm not at all pleased about this inflation rate. And if we were sitting down having lunch, you'd hear me complain about it as much as anybody. Uh, but what I would like you to notice is that there is an issue where inflation will hopefully continue to get better. But as I'm going to show you in a moment, it might not get better. It might actually get worse for a while. And that, I think, is what the big issue is. If oil prices go up, if if uh, the whack-a-mole supply chain issues go up, if uh, more uh, countries have to close down for whatever reason, uh, those things can, can drive this up. Uh, supply and demand issues, oil costs, energy costs, all of that can be very problematic. As a matter of fact, if I go to the, uh, let's see, this it here, what I'm looking for? Oh, that's not it. It's this one here. There we go. This is breaking out inflation over uh, from January of 2015 till most recent, I guess July of 2022. And what you're seeing here is all the different price points for all items for food, food at home, et cetera. And what you what you recognize here is that some areas have seen a huge spike, but those same areas also saw big drops as well. Fuel oil back in 2020 uh, dropped 37 percent. But unfortunately, back in May of this year, it was up 106 percent. It has come down and now it's at 58 percent. If we break this out, we look at, for instance, electricity. I'm sorry, gasoline. Gasoline was at a 60% increase, and most recently here in October, it's a 17% increase. Now, that doesn't mean that it's gone backwards in price, although that certainly is an impact on it, which we're going to talk about that in a second as well. But what it does mean is that if we can get some of these expenses to go into reduced uh, inflation, then that changes everything. And while I'm not saying that's what's about to happen, not sure it is. It is one of the things that we're watching to see how that looks. Um, we're gonna cover all these questions here at the end. All right, so, so that gets us to come back here to this information. So here's some things to, to take note of. So this is looking at month, which is a rolling 12 month number. So we didn't have 7.7% in the month of October. What we had was, an average of 7.7% for the last 12 months. What we find over here is we find the averages for those months as they, as, as they all came together. So for instance, 2021 ended up with a 4.7 average, and this is building on all these other numbers where this is, this is how the year end worked, and this is what the average of all the previous numbers were. So what we find is we find that there are years here, matter of fact, interestingly enough, 2009, actually had a negative inflation. Now, most of the time inflation goes negative because you have competition, but sometimes it does because supply and demand issues, if there's more demand than supply, it will force prices down. And when I say competition, you've got two restaurants that maybe compete with each other and one wants more business, so they lower the price of their meals to get us to come there. That's one thing. But another thing that can cause this is you have more demand, more buildup, than what supply calls for. That can also force prices down. And so you'll notice here during 2009, you see you had a number of months where the inflation rate was negative. So that doesn't mean that, that that's what's about to happen now, but it is a possibility if supply chain issues work out, which is one of the things we've talked about for the last six months, if they start getting supply chain matters under control, we might find that there is a demand where overproduction happens, which then forces pricing to go back down, which then lowers the average annual uh, inflation rate during our lifetime. Now, if we take this a little bit further back, and this is where I was going to this chart. So this is going starting in 1914. And in 1914, we see that there's a, a number of times. For instance, this is 1917 at 17% for the average, 18% for that year. Uh, 20.4, you can see these averages, but you then see in 1921, we saw a negative inflation down about 10%. Next, it happened negative six. Then we continued on for a while. Uh, then we get into the Great Depression in the, in the 30s, 10%. Uh, we see inflation rates drop down again. We move back up in 1940, 42. 
uh, move forward to a period that I think most of us can remember, the 1970s, here's 74 at 11%. 9% went down to 5.8, 6.5, 7.6, 11.3, 13.5, 10.3. .3. You get the picture that, that we could experience a number of years where we have inflation, but we might not because there may be other times where we find that you have uh, a much quicker uh, recessionary reaction. And then we get back to some much nicer numbers in the threes, twos, twos, threes, twos. And so then we come down here to last year, we're showing the average at 4.7, but the year over year was seven. And that gives us, that brings us to today at 7.7. .7. So next month on December 13th, when we get the new numbers in, we'll find that this one will have dropped off. We'll be at this one. So then the question is based on the data, will inflation go up or down? If it does go up, obviously that's going to continue to hamper the economy. But if it doesn't go up, it continues to move in a downward direction, that could be positive. So now, how does this all fit with where we are today? Well, a lot of things. Um, policies that governance puts in place can impact this, certainly oil, drilling, etc. cetera. Uh, that could have an impact on this. Supply chain issues, as I mentioned before, um, even the ability to start new businesses because of regulatory matters and, and financing and interest rates and so on. All of that comes together and uh, it, it makes me think to myself, you know, there could be some good times ahead, but there could just as easily be some bad times ahead. Now, why do I tell you there could be some good times ahead? Well, because if we do analytics on the market, there's something interesting that's happened. Now, you all know that we pulled uh, all clients back to more conservative positions. Even our most aggressive ones, we moved them back to some more conservative positions, unless they asked us not to. We didn't go all the way to the most conservative, but people that were more conservative went further. So for instance, simply put, if you were a profile five, we moved you back to a profile three. If you were a four, we moved you back to a two or 2.5. But we got more conservative because there was a lot of data here. And this is looking at the S&P 500, uh, going back for the last year, a lot of data in here that was very concerning. Uh, but then here in October, after a bad, bad September, October started to take off. And you'll see that October has actually hit a pretty decent number. For those of you who are new here and don't haven't followed this a lot, you've got the 50-day moving average, and the 200 day moving average. And then this represents the daily activity. So the, the daily activity, as you can tell, is incredibly jagged. I mean, it just up and down, up and down. It's like watching a school of fish go through the water. The reason you have these moving averages, 50 days, for instance, helps us sort of smooth out the, the jaggedness, the volatility, and be able to see what's a pattern. And what you'll notice here is that pattern has started to move up. The 50 day moving average has actually started to to go up. I'm not saying that's where it's going to go, and I'll show you some more information here in a second, but that is what started here, and that's because the daily activity is so far above the 50-day the moving average. And you'll also note that we had this very nice day up here. We had this huge run up. That's part of what happens as well. You'll notice it's flattening out a little bit here. It hasn't quite hit that 200-day moving average, and one of the questions becomes what happens when it does. Does it break above it? what's called convergence, divergence in a positive way and, and keep on going or does it pull back? Now, if I'm looking at the shorter moving averages, the, the 12, 26 and nine, what I see is that they're moving in a positive and I can look at the, the shortest of them and say, okay, so they are in a positive, they're moving in the right direction. So that could be a decent sign. Um, but at the same time, it could just be a moment in time because it'd be fair to say we'd go back here. That worked out pretty well. You can follow this up here. That worked out pretty well for a while. And then it turned south and then everything else went south for a while. So one of the reasons we're more conservative right now is because it's hard to say where we're actually headed. Um, we know there's a possibility we could have some major costs in energy when it comes to gasoline and, and diesel and and that includes home oil, home fuel oil. So those pieces cause us to be a little more concerned. But I would also tell you that this technical analysis makes me feel a little more positive too. So watching that 
gives me some sense of of uh, hope that that maybe things are changing a bit because there are so many levers on the economy that, it, and I get it. Some people will be like, oh, it's terrible. It's never going to get any better. I understand that. I've been doing this for over three decades. I get that feeling. Uh, but history has, shot, has, has taught me that sometimes it's not as bad as I think, and sometimes it's worse than I think. But usually, it, it all works out well in the end. If I take this back, and just as a quick reminder, let's take this back for five years. Because as I say this, I think, again, that many people really uh, struggle with this thought. Here it is. So here's where we are today. This is with the S&P 500. So you follow this line across. This right here is the high before the pandemic hit. So all this way down here is where we are. And I think most people who aren't really watching everything carefully think that we're in much worse shape than we were before the pandemic. Well, we're not, we're actually in better shape. This, all the way down to here, is before, is the pandemic at its worst. And if I bring it over here and come back up again, you can see we're well above that. So while I recognize the dangers, I certainly noticed like you that the highs keep getting lower and the lows keep getting lower. Uh, again, one of the reasons we moved into more conservative positions is because some of this data makes me think it could get worse before it gets better. Will that be this quarter, next quarter, or halfway through next year, or late next year? I don't know. But I know that, as I've told you many times before, we try to be proactive wherever possible and reactive wherever necessary. So hopefully, this kind of gives you some insight into what we're seeing with sort of the technical analytics for the market. And, and that's not a particular fund or a particular security, but rather just the market itself overall, 500 largest companies in America, large cap index by the 11 industries. But now let me show you one other thing that I think is pretty interesting as well. When the markets begin to turn around, they turn around based first on strength, and then they follow uh, along behind with some of the more weaker positions. And when I say weaker, what I mean by that is uh, the positions that aren't the biggest companies in the country. And so that brings me to the Dow, which represents the 30 largest companies in America, broken out again by industry. Let's go ahead and bring this back down to a year. And let's do a quick comparison on how the uh, Dow is performing compared to the S&P. Remember, these are big companies. These are the companies that People, if they're going to invest the blue chips, these are the ones that people feel represent the, the safest opportunities in a volatile market. And notice that the Dow has not only run up to the 200-day moving average, but it broke through it. It actually has exceeded what the 200-day moving average is. The 50-day moving average is definitely moving in a positive direction, and the 200-day moving average has flattened out now. Now, where's this gonna go in the future? Uh, again, no, nobody knows the answer to that. I don't care who you talk to, none of us know the answer. But what we do know is that when we look at data like this, it does give us information to consider. So when the money is flowing into the markets by a lot of volume, then that gives us confidence that there is money moving back in. And when it's flowing into the bigger companies, that's usually, usually, not always, usually, the beginning of some sort of a, a return to the markets. Notice that the highs still are getting lower, but this is the first time where the high might actually run into it and uh, maybe go above it. Now, I'm not saying that I think it is going to. Matter of fact, the truth is I'm going to be surprised if it does break through it and hold. But I would also say I'm surprised it's happening this soon. I didn't expect it to. So my thinking is is that we need to, again, be proactive wherever possible, reactive whenever necessary. And so while we're not going to make moves to get our clients back to the more aggressive positions that they were in before, um, we're watching carefully because that day may come sooner. And if it does, I want to be ready for that. If it doesn't come, I want to be protected for your benefit as well. So here's a couple other pieces. Notice that, again, this the gray line running across the top there, that really is a psychological barrier called a ceiling of resistance. And so for the market to break through of that, hold it, maybe go back and test it again and take off again, that would be a very positive sign. 
whether it's the end of anything yet, I wouldn't say that, but I would say it's a very positive sign. I would also point out if I go down to the shorter technicals, I would say that I also see with the 12 and the 26 that they're still moving in a positive direction. But I would also say the nine, the shorter one, is, is actually starting to come down now. And that's an indication that maybe this particular run is over for the moment, but over the next, and you'll notice here, this is back in August. So over the next few months, we might see a more movement up or down, and then maybe another opportunity. So hopefully by the next uh, update we have, you'll be able to uh, have a, a better feeling for what's going on. I certainly expect I will. And uh, if we have any questions between now and then, I'd be happy to go over those with you. So if I'm looking at the, uh, the economic data, let me go back to our update. There we go. What I would tell you is I think the technical analytics for the market show a hopefulness that things are going to get better. What I would also tell you is that the economic data itself is spotty. There's, uh, there's some areas that are better, and then there's other areas that aren't. And so probably in our next update, we're going to spend a little more time on the various industries and sector rotation, how those are playing out as it relates to this technical data. And again, I would also point out that there's nothing here that is, that's guaranteed or that that I could identify and say, this is certainly what's happening, up or down, volatile or not volatile. I would say though, that this is part of that information that we look at to make decisions on how to invest accordingly with market conditions as they are. Again, part of the reason for that, and I'm just gonna buzz through this since you've probably seen this before, we try to minimize drawdown as much as possible because again, if we have a $100,000 account and the market falls 50%, it takes 100% to get back up to zero again. And so I'd much rather get conservative and have a much lesser drawdown I have to deal with than try to fight coming all the way back up again. Um, but having said that, we don't make changes a lot in the portfolio unless the data really supports doing so. Um, it's, it's, it's an art and science kind of decision. The, the science part is what I just showed you, the technical information, the art, that part of it is really more just trying to get a good read on it, which I think all of you are doing the same. It's one of the reasons you tuned in tonight, but I'm sure you've got other sources you're listening to as well, trying to figure out where is all of this going. And yes, the election just from last week probably either either adds to or takes away from any confidence you had before. Depends on how you view it. Some uh, some view it as a as a positive outcome or at least a an acceptable outcome, some view it as a terrible outcome. I think what we'll find here is that another two or three months from now, as we watch how both parties and their leadership reacts to what they see, what they, they saw in that election night, hopefully we'll see some more uh, conservative thinking. I think that'd be wise. I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I think fiscal uh, soundness is it plays well no matter what economy you're working in. And I think that, as I mentioned, when I started on the inflation information, clearly the biggest problem here is that we have printed so much money. And as you hand out all this money, no matter how you hand it out, that amount of money is going to cause inflation. That's why it isn't a surprise that we've had inflation. And while the, the uh, supply de and demand issues, the supply chain issues created somewhat of a transitory problem, the overprinting of money, the quantitative easing, all of those things, that's really what has driven much of the inflation we're experiencing. And now the question is, how, how do we come back out of it? Is it gonna be a soft landing or a hard landing? And so right now the data is inconclusive, but I would say the market information I just showed you, uh, look, things that the, uh, would appear the market's kind of looking forward on that. So again, we'll take time for questions and so on, but I would remind you that this is the reason we diversify your portfolio. We don't put all of our eggs in one basket. We use all of these models. Not everybody on this call is using every one of these uh, solutions or strategies, but for you based on whether or not you're wanting more growth oriented or you're wanting more income oriented, you want more risk and reward or less risk and reward, uh, whether you need liquidity, um, whatever the, the flexibility, whatever the issues are that you're looking for, we use these 
various pieces to create a portfolio that matches your needs to create that that uh, response that handles the uh, the markets the economy and your needs in as most efficient uh, way possible so again uh, every time i meet with uh, some of you we talk about these items and as always if you have questions i'll be happy to go over those with you and even talk with you about your current modeling if you have any particular questions about that Oop, there we go so that really brings me to what i wanted to spend some time on tonight because uh you know it's funny i was visiting with a uh, a new client and uh, uh, they happen to work in the building industry and i made the comment that having a solid financial plan is like having a blueprint for uh, a, a building you're going to build most contractors um, maybe all and most people wouldn't start building something without having a blueprint and a plan and so from a financial planning perspective your financial plan is that answer especially if you are concerned about what's going on in the economy and the markets and how that's going to impact your future whether you're a few years away from retirement you're right on retirement you just retired or you're a few years into retirement having a good plan helps answer the concerns that you would have and when i say that what i would remind you of i've shared this in the past but i think it just bears repeating there's really four questions that a well-developed financial plan should answer for you and those questions come to the question or the the thought process of can i retire and stay retired so the first question has to do with uh, percent sign rate of return which that that question is what rate of return do i have to make on my money between now and the time i retire to retire and stay retired a well-developed financial plan should be able to show you how much you need to be making on your money your how much you have to return on your money to make it so you can retire and stay retired and uh, the the more you have and the less you need uh, from income then the lower your return number has to be the less you have and the or the more you need from your uh, portfolio to meet your lifestyle needs requires you to have more rate of return but having a plan that that looks out into the future and shows you a track that you're on uh, helps you to identify which retirement curve you're on the runaway green curve the the typical blue curve or the red curve which runs out of money before a run out of life knowing that return number is important the second question think dollar sign if you haven't retired yet or redirected as we call it how much do you have to invest monthly or annually between now and the time that you retire to retire and stay retired how much do you have to start saving again a well-developed financial plan will help you answer that question so you know if you're on track or off track question number three think the word work how many years do you have to work between now and the time you retire to retire and stay retired is it one year is it 10 years is it what you're hoping it's going to be is it less than that or more than that again a well-developed financial plan can give you answers to that question now i would also say if i'm looking at these three questions here what i find is that when i see somebody who their retirement planning model isn't working out like they would like then basically it's a change of one of these first three answers earn a little bit more uh, invest a little bit more work a little bit longer or a combination of those and that oftentimes especially if somebody is already uh, you know planning ahead and has some resources set up uh, they can usually answer that pretty easily with that at least to determine the right track to make sure you're on track now i would also say that a good financial plan would also include stress testing so what if uh, as you build your plan you build a, what seems like the best most likely scenario you're going to go through but the reality is is when i go do look at those uh uh curves of retirement uh the further out we get past year five six or seven i don't know if i believe those numbers either because so many things can happen and so we stress test it what if the markets don't do as well what if there's a health issue what if there's a long-term care issue what if there's a premature death we can look at that and say with greater confidence if we stress test a plan with the rate of return you earn on your money how much you are saving or have saved and how long you have worked or are planning to work if you're on track or not but that really then brings me to the last word lifestyle question number four 
if my current plan isn't working, meaning the plan I'm on, those first three points, isn't going to work out like I'd like for it to, how much do I need to reduce my retirement lifestyle to make it possible to retire and stay retired? Now, if that if, if you're like me, that question kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies a bit. You don't want to think about that question. I get that. Nobody does. But I would throw out this. If what you believe to be true turned out to be false, how soon would you like to know? Most of us would like to know sooner rather than later. And so if it turns out that the plan isn't going to quite work like you'd like for it to, and the adjustment of return and dollars and work uh, doesn't quite answer everything, then the last choice is a way to help make it work so you could retire and stay retired. So these four questions should be able to be answered pretty confidently, not guaranteed, but pretty confidently when it comes to looking at your retirement, your planning for the future, premature death, how to, uh, how to plan wisely to create tax efficiency, income efficiency, investment efficiency, or at least more efficiency, so that you can have confidence that when that day comes that you're ready to plant your flag at the top of the mountain and retire, you are confident that you can do it. So that's the purpose of planning in general. Now, with that in mind, what I'd say is this, there are three phases of your financial journey and direction determines destination. While I know and you know that no one can know what the future holds, and we can say confidently that the only thing certain is uncertainty, it doesn't mean that we can't at least build a blueprint that helps us figure out what to do. Or maybe another way to say it is this, uh, I just had a, an investor conference down in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I went down there, had everything planned out. It was awesome, I really enjoyed it. And then Nicole came through and my flight back got canceled, at least one leg of it did. So I had to work out some different options, uh, but here I am back in Daytona, it all worked out. So I had to make some adjustments and chances are you will have to do the same on your financial journey, just like I will, but we can plan wisely through that process. And so keeping that in mind is that what we have is the pre-retirement or accumulation phase. We get to the top of the mountain, we plant the flag, then we have the post-retirement or decumulation phase. And then at the beginning of that, we have sequence of return. That's what S of R stands for, sequence of return risk, meaning that if our planning has bad investment results for the first five years, so any, any couple of years in that first five years, that can really hurt a financial plan and your retirement plan in, in, in total. And it can really damage how long your money will last. And so that's why we spend a, a fair amount of energy as we look at the decumulation phase to say, how are we gonna handle sequence of return risk? And then the other part is at the last of our life, there's end of life issues, EOL, end of life issues. And that's the place where if, uh, if you're, one spouse has a lot of health issues and they use up a lot of resources at the end, does the remaining spouse still have resources to make it to the end of their life as well? That's another reason why we stress test and look for ways to maximize efficiency to create the best outcome. And then finally, the third phase is transfer because we both we all pass away sooner or later, death and taxes, that whole story. We know that transfer is gonna happen and so we wanna plan wisely for whatever transfer we want to happen to do everything we can to make that happen. Some of you might say, I don't care if my kids get anything. That's fine. Then you, you build the plan that way. Some of you might say, I want my kids to get this. You build a plan that way. Because in the end, what this really comes down to is right here. What's your desired return on life? Return on investment is important, no doubt about it. And you have to have good return on investment or at least acceptable return on investment. But what I would also say is that at the end of our lives, none of us are going to be thinking to ourselves, man, I made 10% last year or Doggone it, I lost 3% last year. We're going to think to ourselves, what did we do with what we had? And that's why that last phase on transfer is when we look back, we wanna make sure that on the accumulation phase and the decumulation phase and how we handled family and friends and charities that we care about, that we accomplish the return on life we want. And that's another aspect of what financial planning does. It helps you work through the three phases of your financial journey and helps you to get from where you are to where you want to be with that return of life as well as everything else. That's why when we do our 
our annual planning appointment schedule for those clients that have financial plans, we break it out into three trimesters. First trimester, the first third of the year, we work on planning review, planning renew. For those of you on here who actually have a financial plan functioning with us and it's really working well, you got what's going on, you know that from January to just after tax time, we're gonna take time to go over your plan, look at what was accomplished in the last year and look at what we want to accomplish in the coming year with your life goals and life transitions. In the second trimester from mid-April to uh, mid-September, that's when we review all of your investment and insurance. Looking at past year and what we're hoping to see happen in the, in the coming year, to try to set everything up in the best way possible. Now, on this one, just for you to, to realize, that doesn't mean we won't talk about investments and insurance back in here. If you have questions, that's what this part's for, and we'll be happy to answer those, and likewise here as well. But our focal point for our planning clients is to really aim at doing planning review renew in the first third of the year, investment and insurance review and renew in the second third of the year, and then finally, in the last third of the year, our goal is to sit down with you to look at how to minimize tax expense. Uh, we're not accountants, but we can help with some planning items to help think through how do you keep more money on your side of the balance sheet and less going to the IRS. We not only do that for the current year, but we also try to carry it out and look forward into future years to see what we can do to help minimize taxes there. Plus, with your estate, your estate design, your will or trust, we take a look at that to see is everything set up beneficiary-wise, as well as um, the transfer costs. When you transfer these assets to other heirs, um, are there gonna be a lot of expenses and fees attached to it? Are there ways to minimize that? And so the first, second, third trimester of the year, our goal is to help you make the most of what you're doing as your financial plan puts you in a position to, to, to make all this happen. We try to take time, just like I'm doing right now, to talk about during our webinars, to say, okay, so we wanna start looking ahead at each piece. And so right now, I'm talking about planning concepts, solutions, and strategies to get our planning clients and those who haven't yet started with that but are thinking about it, be ready for the first trimester in 2023. Now, when I say financial plan, I realize that many people don't really know what a financial plan is. They know what a tax return does, they know what a will or a trust does, but they don't really know what a financial plan does. So let me just explain, a financial plan answers those four questions. And, I, and a financial plan should help you be able to identify the curves of retirement or how to get to goals you want or what you need to do for life transitions and life goals to achieve the return on life you want. That's what a financial plan should do. A tax return, make sure you pay your taxes. A will or a trust, make sure your estate's transferred. A financial plan helps you maximize life in the best ways possible to accomplish what you want, but even more so, it helps you identify challenges before you run face first into them, if possible. Can a financial plan help you create, grow, protect, and preserve wealth for you and your family? The answer is clearly, it can. Again, nobody would start to build a house without having a blueprint. Nobody would start a trip, a long trip, without having a plan on where they're gonna go, how they're gonna get there, uh, where they're gonna stay once they get there. And that's what a financial plan should do. How often should your financial plan be updated? Never, occasionally, at least annually? I think it should be annually because everything is changing. I mean, 2020, I didn't know COVID was coming. 2022, didn't know that inflation was gonna be like this. So updating your financial plan along the financial journey is much like uh, looking ahead on your GPS to figure out what you see ahead and what, what changes or adjustments you need to make. And so that's what a financial plan's about. I, I would tell you that most people don't do it, but those who do feel more confident about where they're going. And that's why we, we provide that as one of the services that we, we do. Uh, when, when I look at, at why we choose this, I would say to you that when I first started the industry, uh, I was taught how to work with investment strategies. And that seemed like a great idea. And I understood that. And then later on, I was induced, introduced to why insurance strategies were important because they protect and preserve wealth. Investments can create and grow wealth and, and insurance can protect and preserve wealth. And as you can tell, even by this little diagram, it created a better balance for clients. But what I really realized along the way was a financial plan actually helped create the right base for how much to invest, 
and how much to have to live life and enjoy it, how much you, you put on risk management issues to protect and preserve assets, and how much did you not need based on your wealth? You could say, well, I don't need that. So all of those items, these three together, are designed to identify the unique possibilities that you need when it comes to managing wealth wisely for your family, for the future, and even future generations as well. So when we look at planning, that's one of the reasons we do it this way. So when we do our planning, and all I, this is not me telling you you have to do it, this is me sharing with you something that I think some of you probably aren't aware of, because I think it's an important piece as we move into the beginning, the, the first quarter, the first trimester for us on 2023, I want everybody to be aware this is something that's available to them. One of the things that I've shared with you many times before, you have a wealth management dashboard that's available 24-7, 365 for all of your financial information needs. Uh, there's daily updated of that on the online financial information you've connected. Consolidated reconciliation available for your online cash accounts. There's a whole report suite that makes it so you can pull up information for banks or if you're getting loans or if you need to pull information together, depending on how you set up your uh, spending information that you pull up for taxes and so on. There's an electronic vault that's available 24-7, 365 for your essential documents. So, you know, we've all survived, both Ian and Nicole. Hopefully you did well during it, but let's suppose, God forbid, something happened to your house and all of your important documents were, were there. In the electronic vault, if those were all stored in there, you could just go to the, some place where your computer connects up, print them all out, and you have them all back, at least to start that process of getting your life back together again, which Unfortunately, I haven't had anybody who's had to do that yet, but it is there for those who would. Um, what we do, as I said before, in our trimesters, we have an advisor-led planning review every four months with current year-end and long-term tax strategy reviews, annual beneficiary, estate design, tax and expense reviews, annual risk management assessment for your insurance programs that are uploaded to, the, to your financial plan, uh, annual investment policy reviews so you can make sure that your risk and reward makes sense, annual review of directly managed assets, that's items that we classify as assets under management, things we directly help you manage, as well as indirectly managed, or what we call assets held away, to help you review those and understand how that's being impacted both short and long term. Annual review update of your life goals and life transitions, so I'll show you that in a second. Obviously, you're here on the monthly investor update webinar, so we do that, and client requested reviews available anytime, even though we have the three meetings planned with you. It doesn't mean we won't meet other times. If you have a meeting that you want to get together and talk about that, be happy to do that. That's not a problem at all. Let's see here, another question. Okay. Ah, great question. That actually worked out really well. So where, so, so Diane asks, where is this information available? It's right here on our website. Go to our website, go to the client login section, there's a wealth management dashboard that you can that we give you a link to so you can go in and get to your wealth management plan. Your investments come to your investment management dashboard. These are assets under management. This identifies both AUM, assets under management, as well as AHA, assets held away. This one shows you exactly what we're doing, gives you really uh, uh, updated information that has performance data attached to it so you can see what's going on. This is for those with investments with us. This is how we help you assess risk versus reward, uh, identifying a scale of one to 99. 99, you're really aggressive. One, you're not very aggressive at all. Then we can take that information and apply it back here and say, how are all your, how are all of your investment strategies matched up to your risk tolerance? So let's say you score a 75 and your investments are all set up at a 35. Well, maybe you're being a little too conservative or let's reverse it. Let's say your risk scoring is 35 and your investments are set up for 75. That could be a problem, so we want to take a look at that. That's what this is about. And then finally, all of this is sort of uh, fact kind of information. Your financial life plan is the last piece to it because it identifies your life goals as well as life transitions. It gives you the ability to do a quick little assessment that identifies life transitions and life goals. You can apply a high, medium, or low priority to them, and then we can use this to tie back into your financial plan to help, in my opinion, maximize your ROL or return on life. So that's where you find this information at our website and you just go to the uh, to the login button. It'll bring you right here. Now, if you don't currently have these links set up, you'll have to let us know and we'll be happy to get you the information so it can be linked up. Um, and 
I'd be happy to do that in a heartbeat for you. So now, uh, if this is this is that great place where if you got any questions, we're near the end of the update. I spent some time kind of doing market and economic information with you and then wanted to get you set up for the discussion we want to have because in the end, if you think about it for just a moment, whatever inflation is, whatever the economy does, whatever the markets do, having that information put together in your financial plan and updated on a regular basis can certainly give you the the confidence or the information to make adjustments accordingly to get back to what you need to do. Back to those four questions again. Think rate of return, think dollars you've either saved annually, monthly, or currently have saved. Think work, how many years do you have to work? Think lifestyle, how much would you have to reduce it? But all four of those questions together, and hopefully you don't have to answer question number four, all four of those questions together can tell you if you're on track or off track with your financial planning goals, with your family's wealth management strategies. That's what we give the advice for to help you maximize it. So again, I'm watching here. I don't see any questions coming through, but if there are, I'll be happy to answer those. But even if after uh, the update's over, if you say to yourself, hey, I'd like to ask a question, just email us at either my email or you can, where's that little thing out there? Oh, back here. Um, info at Frank's office. You can email there. Um, we'll be happy to get back with you and either schedule a phone call or schedule a face-to-face -face meeting, whatever it takes, an online webinar for those of you who aren't local, um, happy to help answer those questions for you. Okay, got a hand up here. There we go. Let's see here. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I can unmute you, Callan. Let me see if I can. I'm going to try to. Callan, can you ask your question? Um, yeah, I, just a curious question about the stock market and, and uh, the energy market. I mean, it, it seems like that that's really a driver in a lot of the inflation issues, I mean, at least from what you said. And, you know, in my company, before I retired, I mean, if we invested capital dollars, we kind of recovered them over 20 years. But if yeah. our government is, is hell-bent on trying to get these you these gas companies <laughs> to to be out of business in 15 years and they've got all this capital money invested i mean how are they going to recover their money for their their shareholders and and how are we going to see gas prices go down one day and and what happens if these gas companies are you know non-existent for the lack of better words i know they're diversified companies but where is the stock market going to recover from these huge companies? Yeah, that, that's, that is a, an excellent question. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you back so we can have that. Oh, look at you, you already did it, you're good. Um, so so what, what I'm gonna say is this, a couple of things. Um, and, and that was a great question about capital investment that a company would put into it and what they expect to see return on over, you said 20 years, I think, a lot of smaller companies are looking for something much faster than that. Um, but let's let's answer the question. So so right now it seems that there is a desire to create some sort of utopian future where we don't our energy comes from uh, I'll call it cleaner resources, um, wind, uh, water, um, things of that nature, solar, etc. Uh, also, the desire to make them renewable. That's another piece of this as well. Um, I, I think that is, I think that's admirable. I get the value of it. And uh, I think, I don't think any of us on this call would say, oh, we don't ever want to see that. That's not good. We'd much rather keep burning uh, oil and, and uh, coal and natural gas and so on. But I think the problem is, is that we do not have a system that can handle it. We just saw in California, for instance, that that their energy grid cannot charge all the cars and keep people's homes heated all at the same time. They're just not set up for it. Um, we also have seen last year in the winter time that in Texas, they had some problems because of uh, cold weather they hadn't anticipated and it messed with their uh, wind power system. Uh, we also know that that uh, if we could switch everybody to electric cars today, 
we'd have a bigger problem because the batteries, when they go bad, we don't have the capacity or resources on what we're going to do with all those. And that's actually worse than what, inter what, what oil and gas is doing. So I think these pieces come together and say that on one side of the aisle, we have a group of people that I think is, they have a desire for something better. I'd like to, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and say, I think they want something better. Although I think probably like everybody, there's, there are uh, financial gains to be talked about as well. But nonetheless, we'll assume the very best and say they want something better. But the problem is our technology doesn't support it right now. And, and that's really the bigger issue is that we don't have the capacity to do it yet. So I think that as we go over the next five or 10 years or so, we're going to see a recognition that we have to come back a bit. Um, for instance, one of the things that's happening, I, I think it's fascinating that um, we're going to other countries and saying, hey, would you give us oil? Um, well, first of all, I like to point out they're drilling in the same earth. Whether they're drilling in Florida or they're drilling in Venezuela, it doesn't matter. They're still drilling in the same earth. The second thing I'd like to point out is that many, company, many countries like, like, for instance, China, uh, their gas isn't as clean as ours. Uh, our our um, small gratings and our uh, environmental concerns have made our gas incredibly clean compared to where we're buying it from right now. And so consequently, I think there's lots of uh, uh, well-intentioned but poorly thought out strategies right now. So if we're on this path that you described, Callan, which I think you're right, we are, if we're on this path, for now, uh, I think that as uh, the electorate begins to understand more and more about what's going on, and more importantly, the ineffectiveness of it under our current technological abilities, I think that you're going to see that come back the other way. Uh, I think that then we are going to see that recovery of capital, and when we see that, I think that that's going to create another boom period. Um, Again, I, I kind of reviewed some of that a little bit in a previous uh, update, uh, I think not last month, the month before. But I really do think that we're looking at a time where right now um, we're sort of ideologically driven. And hopefully within the next uh, couple of years, uh, meaning the next election cycle, and maybe the one after that, we'll get to this place where we really start to identify what really is going to work and what's not going to work. Um, I was listening to a, a, a former military uh, Apache helicopter uh, pilot speaking. And he said, you know, I would believe in the uh, electric vehicles when I see an electric Apache. And I thought that was a great answer. I don't think we're ready for that yet. And I certainly don't think we're ready for all of the cars to go electric yet. And until that point comes when we could really get that done, I think you're going to see the pendulum swing back the other way. Um, remember, it wasn't that long ago that we were much more energy independent and uh, we were uh, able to handle m uh, uh, much lower fuel costs, et cetera. I would, I would say that prior to that, we were told that's not possible either. And then bang, within a matter of a year or so, it happened. And I think that the swing back can be just as fast this next time around as well. But we'll have to give it some time, watch what's going on. But uh, I... I would say, bottom line is, I haven't given up hope. Uh, matter of fact, I'm still looking for opportunities, but I'm also riding cautiously. I see, uh, I see some blue sky, but I also see some dark clouds, and we're trying to make good decisions in the process of that. Hopefully, that will help answer that for you. And I don't see, oh, there's another one there. Okay, got that one already. Okay, so I don't see anything else right now. Um, did I get this here? Oh, okay, got that, okay. All right, so let me uh, hit on this last point because next month is December and I know a lot of you are going to be busy with family and the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas just gets overwhelming. We're not going to do our investor update uh, until January 17th, the third Tuesday of uh, January. Oh, I see that just says 2022. I didn't change that. I got to change that to 2023. That will be January 17th, 2023. I'm not going backwards in time. Uh, so, so we will we'll plan for that. Now, if something tragic or catastrophic or traumatic happened, you have my word, we'll be on here again. But assuming that everything kind of holds the pattern we're doing right now, we're not going to do another update until January 17th. So again, if you have questions uh, regarding you know, family, wealth, income creation, 
growth protection and preservation strategies. We're here for you. Market fundamental and technical analysis. I would be happy to visit with any of you in more specific terms, especially as it relates to your accounts. Uh, when we have the next one, we'll talk about all of these, uh, as well as answers for any of your financial questions. Again, at the next update, or if you have something pressing, be happy to answer that for you sooner rather than later. So as we go through everything here, we have reviewed market and economic data, at least uh, hit a high level of it, drilled down in a couple areas, uh, portfolio management, diversification considerations, the 2023 planning solutions and strategies, hopefully that helped you a bit, our wealth management apps, which you can get to on our website, and your questions. Oh, it looks like there may be another question. Let me see what this is. Um, oh, okay. So uh, I, the question is, I still don't see the last month's webinar updated. Um, there, there has been a technical glitch on last month. We're trying to get that fixed, and hopefully we'll have that updated here this month. We we ran into a technical application issue with one, the, the, the program itself. It didn't, we had to try to figure out how to fix that. And then there was the question the broker dealer had on it. So we're dealing with that, but hopefully we'll have that updated here for you uh, uh, within the next week or so. So keep your eye open for that. And that's on the website under the education tab. And we talked about the next update, which is January 17th, 2023, despite what the screen said. All right. So again, uh, if you would like to invite your friends come that, we had a packed house tonight. That was really fun to see. Uh, please, uh, you, your friends are available to join us anytime, but just got to let us know ahead of time so we can invite them as guests. Um, just got to let Kayla at Frank's office know. Kayla will be happy to get that invitation out to them. Also, again, if you have any questions, uh, you can email us at Kayla at Frank's office or info at Frank's office. Be happy to answer those as well. So it uh, brings me to the close here. I think we've answered all the questions and uh, it's been, a, as always, a pleasure sharing with you. I am looking forward to a great uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday. It's uh, one of my favorite times of the year for Thanksgiving to count my blessings. And I hope you have something like that going on for you as well. So for tonight, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. Tell you it's a pleasure as always to serve you. Look forward to talking to you next year, if not before. And I wish you a wonderful and blessed holiday season, uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, etc. And, uh, oh, one more question just popped up. Let me do that. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Let me go back. Hmm. It's not letting me get there. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh, you're very welcome. You are very welcome. And it's my pleasure. So for tonight, I'm going to go take my son to take a look at a new vehicle for him. <laughs> Maybe get some dinner. And uh, I will look forward to talking to you soon. Have again a great Thanksgiving and Christmas. Be blessed and have a great night.